I'm Basil Siokos, the Director of Programming for Doc NYC, and it's my pleasure to welcome the directors and main subject from the film Nine to Five, The Story of a Movement. Uh, the Academy Award winning directors, uh, Julia Reichert and Stephen Bognar, and co-founder of the Nine to Five organization, Karen Nussbaum. Thanks so much for joining us and for sharing your film with Doc NYC's audience. Very great, um, very happy to do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm going to start with uh, with Julia and Steve. Um, Nine to Five is one of many films that you've made over the years that explore issues related to the working class uh, and labor organizing, including your most recent uh, film, the Oscar winner, American Factory. Um, has the story of Nine to Five been uh, one you've want, been wanting to tell for some time? Uh, and what made now the right moment to sort of tell the story? We have been wanting to tell it for a long time. In fact, we worked on this film for several years before we started American Factory. With, with an archival film like this, where you're sort of digging up history, as opposed to following something that's happening every day, you're sort of, you know, you're digging up archival footage, you're finding people who were part of the organization in this case. It can take a long time. And, you, and there's been no book about nine to five to guide us, you know, we had to really do a lot of original research. So um, I, you know, I love history. I love cinema verite films, but I love history. I've made three basically history films, you know, Seeing Red, Union Maids, and now Nine to Five. I think it's important that people know how movements have changed the world. Movements, people getting together, have actually changed the world. And because we have to know we can do it now. So the opportunity to tell another women's labor story, right, like Union Maids was, uh, it was a great opportunity. And I knew Karen and I had tremendous respect for her. Uh, so it was, actually it was us sitting down to dinner where the whole idea was had, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> And, and Karen, can you can you talk about the importance again at sort of at this moment in this crazy time we're in about sharing nine to five's history and and the impact that it's had uh, through this through this film? Well, the film allowed us, the people who created nine to five and built it all around the country, to appreciate what we did in a very different way. When when we look back on it now, you see between 1968 and 1992, basically a quarter of a century of uninterrupted consolidation of a new right, uh, with the tiny exception of uh, Jimmy Carter's presidency in the middle of that. And so you've got this very deep, uh, uh, important right-wing backlash and consolidation going to on. And in the middle of that, all that, in the 70s and 80s, we built this really special thing um, where we uh, saw some momentum with the women's uh, equality movement, but turned it into our own. And through that, we were able to build something that was uh, that ranged across class. It included working class and middle class women across race. Uh, and it focused on the boss uh, so that it act at its foundation, it was really about changing the greatest inequality in this country, which is class inequality, which is the, you know, who gets all the money and who gets most exploited. And so, uh, and by, with that focus, we were able to build out a part of the women's movement that had incredible energy uh, and was transformative. You know, I gotta, as a, as a history buff, I gotta say that all in between 72 and 73, 1972 and 1973, the anti-ERA movement got started under Phyllis Schlafly, nine to five got started, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg argued her first case of sex discrimination successfully before the Supreme Court, all in the same basically year period. Yeah, wow. Well, yeah. yeah. I and you know, I wanna say the documentaries that have been so inspired us over the years are films not about heroic individuals. Right. Americans love films about heroic individuals, right? That's Hollywood's bread and butter. It's a cowboys. But the documentaries that stand the test of time that are giants are like Eyes on the Prize or How to Survive a Play. Or like this year, we were so inspired by Crip, Crip Camp. Camp. Yeah. A great mm -hmm. documentary. The, and those films and our film, Nine to Five, are about movements, about mm -hmm. groups of people coming together, because that is where change happens. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and this this brings up something I was going to ask a little later, but I'm glad you brought it up now, which is, uh, you know, you know, we seem as a society, I brought, we've talked about this before, but we've seen as a society how um, we kind of have this collective amnesia around collective action and around women's issues and around, you know, larger systemic problems. And we, we talked about in the past, but is, is it just really that we're just too individual fo individually focused and we're not um, really focused on the collective and what the collective can do, or we've been told not to focus on that? Is it the shift from the 1970s power to the people to the 1980s meat generation? If, if you could all sort of speak to that and sort of why you think we are so weirdly uh, having to be reminded all the time about what people together can accomplish. Aaron talks about this collective action, why is it hard for us to consolidate that? It, and it's been different in different periods, obviously, in our country. I grew up in the 1960s. I, you know, I turned 18 in 1968, which was the year that the entire w world exploded um, with revolutionary zeal, uh, genuinely. And in those years, in, in the or early years of the 1970s, people went to, if I've got a problem, I'll call up three of my friends. And before you knew it, you had a group and a group could become an organization. That was the go-to solution uh, in those years. But as part of a restructuring of the values of America uh, into one that instead of really building a middle class and seeing that as tied to democratic values, uh, corporate corporations shifted the entire country in the 70s and 80s and made it all about profit. And it's this is not rhetoric, this is fact. Uh, and that had this tremendous effect on the consciousness of people who felt, uh, especially the women we organized, who over time would be less likely to say, oh, I'll call nine to five if I've got a problem, and more likely to say, well, I'll call my mother and then finally, women would say, well, I pray to God. And then they didn't even do that. They said, well, I just depend on myself. So what we have now is a country filled with very self-reliant individual women who have zero access to collective power and now find themselves far worse off than we were in 1973. And obviously, the, the sorry, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Basically. And I would say, obviously, sort of the union busting, which I, I know is uh, obviously a huge thing that you've been uh, dealing with with your work for working people and uh, over the decades. But union busting is part of that, too. It's telling people the unions aren't the way to go. You shouldn't collectively bargain. You shouldn't be doing all these things together. Yeah. And then we're in the situation we are now. But I'm so glad you brought that up, because for us as filmmakers, with you know American Factory, where you we had a huge chapter where we saw union busting at work, like we actually saw it, and we were not allowed to film any of it, which of course we did anyway. We were shocked at that. We didn't know really what that was. I don't think most Americans, even progressive people, understand the huge influence of the union busting industry. Now that industry it came up in nine to five. And after we'd been through it with American Factory, we really, if you remember, Karen, we really amplified that section of the film. People had sort of mentioned in nine to five that in the past, there had been these like one-on-one -on -one meetings with the boss to talk to the secretaries out of trusting unions. There were lots of the same kind of playbook, basically, that they use now was developed in the late 70s, again in the 70s. And so this was a huge learning for us to see it way back then and to see it still active and, and in fact much more sophisticated now. And I know Karen, you ran, I'm really glad you brought that up because I always want to talk to people about that. It's one of those secretive, don't you think, Karen? Parts of American society that has a huge influence. But it's not. So I, I would I would add to your list of highlights of 1973, actually the birth of a, the modern day Pinkertons, the modern day oh. union busting industry. And nine to five ran into it. They would hold union busting uh, uh, seminars, which highlighted nine to five. And there was one in which part of the seminar, which a friend of mine went to and saw uh, undercover, 
uh, where they put up on the slideshow a picture of Teamsters and they say, this isn't who you need to worry about, it's this. And it was a picture of me. So, you know, that we were the new threat in an industry which had not yet been unionized. Uh, which was clerical workers. And so through the 70s and 80s, you see a march by um, big corporations through union busting firms to take out union power in industry after industry, um, manufacturing, food processing, uh, poultry, um, you know, meat packing, uh, uh, transportation. Uh, and so it goes straight through, and we saw it in Ohio, the devastation for formerly unionized workers who mm -hmm. lost their pensions, who no longer, whose, whose pay scale fell in half. Um, uh, and that's a very big part of what happened. We launched the national part of our union the very same week that Reagan uh, locked out the PACO workers, the Denver, air traffic the controllers. Air traffic controllers. It was the same week or right in it there. The same I week. Know. It's, yeah. It was amazing, Faisal, how much these two films ended up informing each other. Yeah. Even though right. one was purely history and one was very much a verite, like hot off, you know, like let's just chase the story day by day. Yeah. So was, right. I want to talk more about the, some of the archival footage we, we discovered along the way. But one, one last thought on this is like the game, I feel like we're talking about one factor that has taken away like quality of life and power for working people. Security. Security, dignity, all that stuff. But it's like the whole game is rigged. You know, we don't actually have a democracy anymore. When you have, when you have nearly three million people who more who voted for one presidential candidate and the other person becomes president, that is not a democracy. When gerrymandered districts determine who's going to be representatives in Congress so, so vastly, that's not a democracy. It's, it's how do I say it? It's hard. We, we're talking about like, where's that sense of collective spirit? But the game is so rigged against people right now that it's tough. Now, all that said, I feel like this summer has given me a whole new wave of hope that the next generation, their leadership, their courage, their ferocity is incredibly inspiring and important. And hopefully that can, that can start to fix this broken democracy. And, and I, know, I know that you want to uh, talk about the archival, but just really quick from, for me, uh, sure. one question was, this is a film that is historically based, obviously, and, and you talk about uh, you know your approach to dealing with that versus something like American Factory in the in the moment. Um, but what is what are the lessons from Nine to Five that you hope will will make that kind of hopeful change that you're looking for uh, in in the present day and in the future? Well, there's a lot of them, but the first and foremost, and Karen should answer this too. Um, fight together, like get together. And the other, I, there's a few that I hope young organizers get today which is you really have to listen to the people you want to organize or you're trying to organize. You have to hear, not impose kind of what you think the structure of your organization should be or who should be the speak, but listen to them about their concerns. And I would say another one is use humor. <laughs> like trying to find a way to skewer the boss and in a way that the average person could say, well, that's wrong. I mean, when you say like McDonald workers, for instance, who we've interviewed a lot of, who are still earning $7.25 an hour, at least in Indiana, most of those people also get food stamps. You know, most of those people get some kind of government help. In other words, our tax money is going to support McDonald's. Okay, well, let's make that really clear in a, in a funny, in a, just a very dramatic way. So I think that's, Another thing is use humor, get together with your fellow workers, and don't be afraid of unionizing. I mean, union, unions, I'm a union, I, I came up in a working class family. My dad was a union man. And I always use the word security. Like we didn't have education, we didn't have books in the house, but we owned our home, we owned our cars, we had vacations, we never worried the heat was gonna be turned off in the winter because he was a union man. He got good wages, he got vacations, he had security, he had health insurance. That sense of security is really lost on the workers at Fuyao, 
on the workers who lost their jobs at the GM plant, that sense that you have a secure life is not something the average working class person, right, Karen, can say anymore yes. if they're not in a union. Yeah, absolutely. So and I would, I would echo Julia on this, that the lessons for me that I think are relevant to today are start where people are. Don't let your words be the enemy of your ideas. Don't set out a litmus test for people to open their minds to, to what, you're, what you're talking about. And secondly, find common ground. And there's plenty that divides us, but you can't explore that until you find common ground. And you can do that across race, you can do it across class, uh, but you have to begin somewhere with those who are uh, the very people that Steve and Julia have been talking about, who are really a common enemy. And then lastly, I'd say that we need both a movement and organization, that you need a, the mass movement that builds and flourishes on vitality and fun and anger, all of those things together. Uh, but if you don't consolidate it in permanent organization, the most important of which can be a union, uh, then you don't consolidate your gains. You don't gain power. You might make a change, but you have no more power. Uh, and so we need those institutions and there's no institution that's more democratic, getting to Steve's point, that practices democracy in a more diverse setting than a union. The trade union movement today is uh, on its heels as we are sometimes, is still the most diverse organization in the country, uh, the biggest women's organization in the country, uh, and the most cross-class, uh, middle-class, working-class organization in the country. Let's build that. It's working. Uh, let's make it stronger. Yeah, like as a my, I always say, what other, what other voice is there for the working class mm -hmm. right. other than unions? So let's just start there. And I love that you say, don't make a litmus test and find common ground. That's very important to young people today. Mm -hmm. And lasting organizations. That's another thing why union maids and seeing red and <clears throat> nine to five are trying to give those, all of them show those lessons. Mm -hmm. So, right. Um, that's great. I mean, uh, we are needing to wrap up, but Steve, I, d I did want to get back to, you wanted to say something about sort of the archival and sort of that process uh, briefly, if you, you want to just jump in. Oh, just real quick. Um, it was such a delight to find the archival footage, and but it was really hard. It took years. And I got to give you an example of why, of how we kind of throw out our history uh, a lot, in our visual history. Uh, so we had to do a lot of looking Nine to five didn't hit like the big news, ABC nightly news. It was a lot of occasionally, local news. Occasionally it did. Yeah, there are a few examples of Walter Cronkite, but a lot of it, it would hit the local news, Cincinnati, Boston, Seattle, whatever. So we went to all those cities and went to all the TV stations who of uh -huh. course, you know, had videotapes of, and uh, what we found in general, I'll give you the example of Cleveland. We went to all the TV stations and one of them said, well, you know, at one point we just threw all our videotapes out in a dumpster in the back of our studio, you know, but some guy came by with a pickup truck and picked them all up. And it turned out that he gave them to Case Western Reserve University oh. and, you know, in Cleveland, and they actually cataloged them. And the reason we have footage from Cleveland more than we have from like Seattle and Boston, et cetera, is because all that stuff was thrown out. Mm. It was thrown out in the dumpster. Wow. But luckily well, the guy with the pickup truck rescued. Yeah, that's, yeah. As, as a filmmaker, I'm sure that sort of drives you crazy to think of all of that footage just going away somewhere. Just like all you know, local terrible yeah. what happens. Yeah. We did have an amazing archival producer, Jane Tucker, and a brilliant editor who's, who pushed this film up the mountain for years, Jamie Meyer Schlenk, and they did heroic work. And we also love our, our score by Wendy Blackstone, who, who just delivered such an emotive, beautiful score for the film. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, with that, we do have to wrap up, but I want to thank you guys again for being part of this conversation. Thank you to Julia thank and you. Stephen uh, and to Karen Nussbaum for joining us uh, and for bringing <laughs> 9 to 5, the story of a movement to Doc NYC. Thank you again. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Bye there.